I decide whether to go out with him, in front of his mother. You must die. Everything is forgiven in a world without a god. She had a change of heart. This novel has the greatest reputation of all his works, even overseas. They say the brothers Karamazov is the culmination of what he wrote in his life. Now let's get started. In his youth, Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov was a coarse, vulgar man whose main concerns were making money and seducing young women. He married twice and had three sons. Dmitri, the child of his first wife, and Ivan and Alyosha, children of his second wife. Fyodor never had any interest in his sons, and when their mothers died, he sent them away to be brought up by relatives and friends. Each son had a dominant personality trait. Dmitri possessed broad passions, Ivan was a cool intellectual, and Alyosha had a spiritual orientation. They all returned home and visited their father to talk about inheritance, and it was the first time they all had been together for quite some time. Fyodor was unhappy to see Dmitri because Dmitri had come to claim an inheritance left to him by his mother. Fyodor planned to keep the inheritance for himself. Fyodor and Dmitri were in competition for the affections of a young woman named Grishenka. Although Dmitri was betrothed to Katerina Ivanovna, a proud woman of the gentry, he had fallen madly in love with Grishenka. But Grishenka kept both Dmitri and Fyodor at a distance because she had hopes of a reunion with her first lover, a Pole who abandoned her years earlier. Alyosha, who was living in a monastery, suggested that they see Father Zosima, Alyosha's mentor. Alyosha believed that the wise old man can settle the dispute between Dmitri and Fyodor peacefully. Father Zosima was patient and kind, but Fyodor and Dmitri end up quarreling anyway. Finally Dmitri knocked Fyodor down. Alyosha worried about their family's future. Alyosha was so gentle and loving that he was concerned only with how he might help his family. Fyodor promised to give Grishenka 3,000 rubles if she becomes his lover. On the other hand, Dmitri recently stole 3,000 rubles from Katerina in order to finance a lavish trip with Grishenka. And he is now desperate to pay the money back. Nobody knew this sum would cause serious incident later. Dmitri wanted to run away with Grishenka, but he felt that he needed to pay Katerina back before he can do so. This is why he was so interested in getting the money from Fyodor. He had written to Katerina that he was sorry about spending her money and wanted to kill Fyodor. Dmitri asked Alyosha to tell Katerina that he's gonna pay the money back to her and never see her anymore. When Alyosha visited Katerina, he was surprised to see Grishenka with her there. Katerina told him that Grishenka was a nice person. She believed that Grishenka wouldn't go out with Dmitri, her fiancé. But Grishenka said, that's my affair. I decide whether to go out with him. Katerina got angry and they had a big fight. Actually, Katerina just didn't want people to think her engagement was broken. She cared about what people would say about her. A few days later, Alyosha visited Katerina again. To his surprise, Ivan was with Katerina, and Alyosha immediately perceived that Ivan and Katerina were in love. Alyosha tried to convince them that they should act on their love for one another, but they were both too proud and cold to listen. Ivan was in love with her, but he felt that Dmitri was a better match for her. Frustrated and disgusted with his family's situation, Ivan said he's gonna leave town. Ivan was gonna go to Moscow. Alyosha went to visit Ivan, and he found him in a restaurant. Ivan had gone there to get away from his father, and Alyosha sit down with him to have an intimate talk. Ivan explained to him the source of his religious doubt. He couldn't reconcile the idea of a loving God with the needless suffering of innocent people, particularly children. Ivan said to Alyosha, there are many kinds of children in the world. For example, 
there was a baby who was shot and killed with a gun by a soldier. At first the soldier was lulling a baby who was held by his mother. The little boy was smiling for him. Then the man took his gun close to the baby's face. When the boy had an interest in the gun with a smile, the man shot him to death laughingly right in front of his mother. At that moment, what's God doing? One day a rich man found that his dog's leg was wounded because of a stone thrown by a boy. The rich man stripped him to the skin and took him to the courtyard where lots of hunting dogs were there. The boy was bitten off to death. At that moment, what's God doing? Why didn't God save the boy's life? For example, stop. I've had enough, Alyosha said. Anyway, any God that would allow such suffering does not love mankind. Then he recited to Alyosha a poem he had written called, The Great Inquisitor. In 16th century Spain, Christ returned to earth at a time when faith had been nearly eradicated by the Catholic Inquisition. The burning to death of heretics was executed. Christ comforted the enemies of the church, who were being burned at the stake, gave sight to the blind, wept with those who mourned, and raised the dead. All who saw him knew who he was. The Grand Inquisitor also recognized him and had him arrested for performing acts contrary to the procedures of the church. One evening, the old Inquisitor visited Christ in his vile prison in order to explain to him why he must be burned at the stake. You must die, because your return would ruin the church's centuries-old attempt to save humankind. The old man insisted. You committed a grave error in rejecting Satan's three temptations in the wilderness, because those three temptations strike at the core of human weakness. At the first temptation, Satan told Christ to turn stones to bread. Second he said, throw yourself from the highest point of the temple. Finally he said, bow down and worship me and rule all countries. But Christ rejected all of them. The Inquisitor said, you should have turned stones to bread because human beings are still suffering from food shortage. You should have thrown yourself from the highest point of the temple because human beings need miracle to believe in God. You should have bowed down and worshipped Satan because human beings need authority to rule a country. Mankind need bread, miracle and authority. So we show them majesty, distribute wealth and maintain public order with authority. Instead of doing so, you gave them free will. You said that people who believe in God have free will. But humans are too weak to bear the freedom of choice that you asked of them. He accused Christ of placing an intolerable burden upon humanity by guaranteeing that people have free will and the ability to choose whether or not to believe in God. In any case, there is no evidence that humanity can handle freedom, so the church, out of love for all people, establishes rules and indices to enslave them. During this explanation, Christ slowly rose to his feet and finally kissed the old man gently. Deeply moved, but clinging to his doctrine, the Grand Inquisitor warned Christ never to return and then released him. After listening Ivan's poem, Alyosha came to worry about Ivan's mental health. He felt that Ivan was deeply disturbed. Are you okay? I'm okay because I have a kind of Karamazov's power. Ivan said. A kind of Karamazov's power? It means greedy and lusty? Oh, no. That's rebellion against God. Alyosha said. Rebellion against God? Ha 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 that's interesting. Ivan replied. After their meal, Alyosha and Ivan part ways, feeling closer than ever. Smerdyakov was an epileptic servant who had been adopted by Grigory, Fyodor's other servants. Many years previously, Fyodor fathered a fourth son with a retarded mute girl who lived in town as the village idiot. The girl died as she gave birth to the baby who was taken in by servants of Fyodor and forced to work as a servant for him as well. Fyodor never treated the child, Smerdyakov, as a son, and Smerdyakov developed a strange and malicious personality. 
But the other brothers didn't know that. Despite the limitations of his upbringing, however, Smerdyakov was not stupid. He enjoyed nothing more than listening to Ivan discuss philosophy, and in his own conversations. Smerdyakov learned the philosophical lessons from Ivan, regarding the impossibility of evil in a world without a god. He frequently invoked many of Ivan's ideas, specifically that the soul is not immortal, and that therefore morality does not exist and the categories of good and evil are irrelevant to human experience. Everything is forgiven in a world without a god. Smerdyakov was possessed with the words. Katerina asked Alyosha to hand a solatium to a man called Snajuriov who had suffered from violence by Dmitri at a bar a few days ago. She didn't want Snajuriov to accuse him. Alyosha saw a boy being picked on by his schoolmates, and he tried to talk to the boy, but he bit Alyosha's hand and ran away. When Alyosha was bringing money to Snajuriov, he recognized the man's son. It was Ilisha, the boy who had bitten his hand. The family was poor, but Snijuriov refused to take the money because he felt that he needed to earn his son's respect after being humiliated by Dmitri, and accepting charity. Especially from a Karamazov, was out of the question. Ivan saw Smerdyakov when he went back to his father's house, and Smerdyakov told him he was worried about Fyodor. I'm worried Dmitri will come to kill him to get money and the old man will be helpless to save himself. Smerdyakov said. What do you want me to do? Why don't you tell me not to go to Moscow and save him? Ivan asked. That doesn't concern me. After all poisonous snakes are killing each other. Smerdyakov said. Ivan took a train to Moscow. He couldn't sleep well because of Smerdyakov's words. Smerdyakov might have told me something important. Ivan went to sleep very troubled. That evening, Alyosha again returned to the monastery, where the frail Zosima was now on his deathbed. Alyosha hurried to Zosima's cell, and arrived just in time to hear his final lesson, which emphasized the importance of love and forgiveness in all human affairs. Instead of asking Alyosha to stay with him during his last days. However, Father Zosima told Alyosha to leave the monastery to be with his family. Zosima died stretching his arms out before him, as though to embrace the world. Many of the monks were optimistic that Zosima's death would be accompanied by a miracle, but no miracle took place. Discovering that Grishenka unexpectedly left home one evening, Dmitri suspected that she had gone to Fyodor's house to get 3,000 rubles and become his lover. Frenzied, he snatched up a pestle and rushed off to his father's house. Catching sight of him in an open window, Dmitri felt such revulsion that he was on the verge of striking him, but, at the last moment, he restrained himself. Running away from the house, Dmitri was seized by his father's servant Grigory. Dmitri hit Grigory with the pestle and, believing him to be dead, left him behind. Dmitri learned that Grishenka had gone to an inn in a nearby town to meet her former lover. Dmitri followed her there, planning to see her one more time before he kills himself. He visited Grishenka. Then the Pole, her former lover, made some disparaging remarks about Russians and Dmitri. Grishenka decided, I don't want to be with such an insulting and vicious man. Dmitri realized that Grishenka had become disenchanted with the Pole, and she and Dmitri declared their love for each other. As the two were coming to terms with their love, Dmitri was torn between joy over his newfound love with Grishenka and grief over the thought that he had killed Grigory. Then, the police arrived and charged Dmitri with murder, not of Grigory but of Fyodor. Grigory's wound was not fatal, but Fyodor was found brutally murdered. Dmitri didn't know the reason why. 
He publicly announced he was looking for 3,000 rubles and was desperate to find them, and Fyodor reportedly had an envelope with 3,000 rubles that was stolen the night of the murder. He was at the scene of the crime, wielding a weapon, the night of the murder. In addition, he had said he would kill his father on several occasions. And very few people believed that he was innocent of Fyodor's murder. Meanwhile, Alyosha was visiting Ilisha, the boy who bit his hand, in the hospital. The boy had fallen quite ill, and Alyosha had gotten to know many of the boy's friends, who were also visiting him. Ilisha and his father Snajuriov genuinely welcomed them. One boy, Kolia, was a leader among the boys. He and Ilisha were friends, but they had a falling out because Ilisha fed a pin to a dog, and Kolia did not approve of his cruelty. When Alyosha came to visit, he and Kolia talked for quite some time. The boy looked up to this wise man about which he had heard so much from the other boys, and he wanted to impress him. The two became friends, and Alyosha treated all the boys as equals. One day, when Kolia went in to see Ilisha, he gave him a dog as a present. He revealed that the dog was none other but the dog Ilisha gave the piece of bread with a pin in it. Kolia had nursed the dog back to health and had fully trained him as a gesture of friendship to Ilisha. Their friendship was deepened. The mood was dampened, however, when the doctors went in to see Ilisha. Without even saying it, everyone understood that the boy did not have much time left. Ilisha was brave, and he tried to lift the spirits of those around him. Later, Alyosha visited his brother in jail. Alyosha said to Dmitri, I believe that you didn't kill our father. After that Alyosha went to talk to Ivan, who felt strangely guilty about his father's death. Alyosha told his brother that he didn't have to feel responsible for a crime that he did not commit, but Ivan stalked off angrily. Ivan met Smerdyukov again, who told Ivan he thought the Karamazov brother was guilty as an accomplice to the murder. He said, you wanted your father dead and left the night of the murder to try to free yourself of the responsibility of protecting your father. Ivan got angry and troubled by this. Then, Smerdyukov flatly admitted, I killed Fyodor and stole money. He said that Ivan's theories and ideas were the basis for his crime and that Ivan's talks with Smerdyukov basically rationalized the deed. Everything is forgiven in a world without a god. He also said, to tell the truth, I'm the son of Fyodor, he never treated me as a son though. I think I have the right to receive some property from Fyodor as his son like you, but I won't insist upon my rights. He handed over the envelope with 3,000 rubles to Ivan. When Ivan returned home after this meeting, he saw hallucinations. A devil appeared in his room. The devil chastised him for being a wicked person with weaknesses and foibles that had led to disastrous circumstances. Alyosha banged on the door and found his brother in a feverish state, muttering about a devil and Smerdyuko. Alyosha stayed the night with his brother to take care of him. Dmitri's trial began. Many people from all around came to see the spectacle of the parricide trial. Dmitri had an excellent lawyer, but it was a hard case to win. The prosecution brought many witnesses who testify to seemingly damning evidence against Dmitri. The defense, however, discredited one after another of these witnesses, showing ulterior motives or mitigating circumstances. Alyosha defended his brother from the stand, and Katerina gave a moving account of Dmitri's honorable nature. Then Ivan came into the courtroom, waving money and implicating Smerdyukov. Ivan madly asserted that he himself was guilty of the murder, throwing the courtroom into confusion. Since he was yelling nonsense, disrupting the trial, and generally acting crazy, the court did not believe him. 
Katerina didn't want people to suspect Ivan. Suddenly, at the end of the trial, Katerina stood up again, showing a letter from Dmitri that clearly stated Dmitri's intention to kill Fyodor as a last resort. She had a change of heart and no longer wanted to lie to protect a man who had hurt her so much. Then word came to the courtroom that Smerdyakov has hanged himself. The audience was surprised and made a stir. Dmitri awakened with a new sense of resolve. He declared that he was ready to accept responsibility for his father's death, even though he was not the actual murderer. Because he had had the intention of killing him. After final statements were made, the verdict came back. Guilty. Dmitri was sentenced to jail. Dmitri welcomed this chance to become a new man. But he did not want to be in exile in Siberia for the rest of his life. He wanted to return to his home country before he dies. After the trial, Katerina took Ivan to her house, where she planned to nurse him through his illness. She and Dmitri forgave one another, and she arranged for Dmitri to escape from prison and flee to America with Grishenka. Alyosha visited the boys with whom he had become friends. They were sad because Ilisha had died. Alyosha gave a speech to the schoolboys at his funeral. Alyosha passed along Father Zazima's teachings of love and understanding. In plain language, he said, You must all remember the love you felt for one another and treasure your memories of one another. The schoolboys, moved, gave Alyosha an enthusiastic cheer. Please subscribe to my channel. We're gonna show you world masterpieces in about 15 minutes with manga. Manga is Japanese-style comics that is easy for everyone to understand. We're sure that you can grasp the context shortly. See you next time.